Okay, so I have one final introduction for the day, and that is for somebody who's really important to MIT and important to C3E. Um, that is Maria Zuber, and she's going to introduce uh, Lourdes Melgar, who is uh, Deputy Secretary for Hydrocarbons from Mexico, and then Maria is going to come back after we've uh, gotten to know Lourdes and heard from her for a while and provide our closing remarks, and we're going to do that all and within about 20 minutes. So. Um, Maria is the Vice President for Research and the E.A. Griswold Professor of Geophysics at MIT. She's the first woman to have led a science department here, the Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences Department, and the first to lead a NASA planetary mission. So she oversees more than a dozen interdisciplinary research laboratories and centers, including the MIT Energy Initiative. And over the past year, she has played a very key role in uh, convening a climate conversation here at MIT and has painstakingly worked with various groups, stakeholders within MIT and was uh, very, very much involved with President Reif and the administration's release of the MIT uh, Climate Plan for Action. And uh, she's somebody I admire. And Maria, please join me on stage. And thanks for coming. So. Okay, thank you very much, Martha. Okay, Lourdes Melgar is currently Mexico's Deputy Secretary of Energy for Hydrocarbons, and immediately prior to that, served as Undersecretary for Electricity. In those positions, she has played a key role in the design and implementation of Mexico's historic energy reform, participating in and then leading the technical group that defined the new model from a comprehensive perspective, including the creation of a liberalized wholesale power market and the establishment of clean energy certificates. She was also a member of the Mexican Foreign Service and has held various diplomatic positions, both in Mexico and abroad. In the academic realm, Dr. Melgar was founding director of the Center for Sustainability and Business at the Elgade Business School at the Monterey Institute of Technology. She has authored articles on energy security, transboundary reservoirs, sustainable development, and the transition to a low carbon economy. Please welcome Dr. Melgar. So good afternoon, uh, ladies and few gentlemen. It is for me indeed a really true honor to be here this, this afternoon. Thank you so much for the introduction. I was feeling a little bit embarrassed having this long uh, CV, but I like to mention a couple of things that are really very important to, to me at my heart. Is one of them is uh, I was truly fortunate to be able to get my PhD from MIT. I'm a course 17. For those of you who are not from MIT, that means I studied political science. I'm a political economist and also I was honored to be named a uh, C3E ambassador for Mexico. Um, I was also here in uh, 2012, and I have to say uh, I was truly inspired by what a lot of young mid-career mid and uh, older women have been doing in terms of energy and energy transformation. And I have to say today I, I really feel um, extremely uh, overwhelmed by what, what, by what I've, I've seen. So congratulations to all the recipients of uh, all the awards, and thank you for, so much for uh, having the opportunity to speak to you. Um, I don't know if, I don't have a clicker to move the presentation, so um, if we could go to the next slide, I'll keep talking, because I know we are short on time. But let me start by saying that uh, Mexico is part of uh, the Clean Energy Ministerial, which is an initiative that President Obama launched uh, for uh, energy and uh, climate change. And um, the last 
CE3, C, E, uh, M uh, conference uh, ministerial took place in Mexico last May in Merida. And what is important to, uh, to uh, underline about this conference is that they decided to move on to the next stage, which is the CEM.2.0. Uh, sorry, uh, in order to launch uh, three, key area, uh, three key areas of work. One is Global Lighting Challenge, meeting the Global Lighting Challenge, the CEM Power System Challenge, and scaling of the Clean Energy Solution Center. Um, of course, these are all areas in which Mexico is quite interested in working on. Uh, you may not know this, but Mexico has a electricity coverage of 98.2% percent, which is, you know, quite high by, uh, by uh, comparative standards. But that means that there are over 2 million Mexicans who still do not have access to electricity. And of course, this is one of our priorities. So also, and uh, I'd like to take one second to mention that Mexicans are not what some people think we are, and I wanted to point out that uh, in terms of distinguished Mexicans, not only do we have our own Nobel laureate, Mr. Mario Molina, who is of course a key sp spokesperson for uh, mitigating climate change, but we also have people like Paulo Lozano, who is the director of MIT Space, Space Propulsion Lab, and of course, a lot of women who are quite making the difference in the science realm. Let me take a couple of minutes to briefly talk about Mexico's energy reform, which we started under the Peña Nieto administration. Uh, President Peña Nieto managed to uh, gather the political consensus to pass an all comprehensive uh, reform, very important reform because in Mexico, uh, trying to move the constitution on energy matters was basically prohibited. You know, it was something that no politician wanted to even try uh, because of the opposition to it. And what we did was a complete overhaul of our uh, energy sector, going from a model based on two state monopolies to a model based on competitiveness, sustainability, transparency, and of course having uh, strong regulators and having this equal footing for all the players, including state-owned companies. So 2013, we dedicated it to designing the reform, um, uh, both in the electricity and in the uh, hydrocarbon sector. 2014, we defined all the laws and starting implementing the reform. And this year, we're uh, into the full implementation of the reform. Uh, in the oil, oil and gas sector, which of course now is part of my responsibility, we are launching the uh, rounds for, uh, the for the first rounds for uh, private participants in oil and gas uh, production, uh, granting the first oil contracts. And in the electricity sector, we are moving towards the creation of a competitive electricity market. Just next week, we're going to be issuing the first auction of uh, clean energy certificates. And of course, this is truly important in order to make sure that we have not only competitive markets, not only that we have the energy that we need to grow, but also that we have clean energy in, in Mexico. So since, we are, so since I have three minutes and I have to go through a lot of slides, I'll be very fast, but mentioning that um, the transformation of the power sector uh, has some components that I really am very proud we were able to put into the law because it includes the clean energy certificates. And as I said, we're having these auctions next, next week. And we also establish a universal service fund. And this is very important to make sure that all Mexicans have access to electricity and that we can move to our fairer uh, fairer world in terms of benefits to all of society. One of the things also is that Mexico, we have a di diversified mix in terms of generation. Currently, um, we have, uh, we're, our aim is to move by 2029 to have 44% combined cycles, 20% wind power generation, 
to have 13% cogeneration, 9% hydropower, and 40% others, in which in others we include uh, nuclear. We have a nuclear power plant with two reactors. But of course, we are moving in dim diminishing the use of fossil of uh, fuel oil and coal towards cleaner uh, ways of generating electricity. Um, so I already mentioned this, so I won't, I won't stop. You will be uh, able to have access to the presentation. Let me talk briefly about two important points also. Um, Mexico has really strong potential in, in geothermal, and I was really interested in looking at the posters that uh, talked about geothermal uh, energy and more efficient use of geothermal, because Mexico had been going down in terms of the ranking uh, worldwide. And we're doing a true effort to increase, again, our geothermal uh, production. And one of the ways we're doing this is opening up this sector for the private sector. And just last, uh, two days ago, I'm sorry, we awarded the first contract for the private sector to produce geothermal energy. Uh, this would allow Mexico to move from the fourth ranking right now in the world to go up to the third ranking and eventually we would like to be able to be in the first place uh, again. Um, one important point, and I, I uh, really enjoyed this morning's presentation by um, Melanie Kinderlein, had to do about the issue of res resiliency. And I would like to comment on this issue because this is something that is not only very important to Mexico, but it's also something that we are quite good at, especially related to hurricanes. Mexico, because of, um, sorry, I'm not moving the presentation, so, oops, okay. Uh, because of its position, as you know, we are quite in the middle between the Pacific and the Atlantic, same as the US, except that we are sort of like slimmer. That means that <laughs> we get hard hit by hurricanes quite often. And uh, one of the things that we have is that CFE, the national utility, uh, has a very good system to reestablish interconnections, the transmission lines, very rapidly. Uh, my daughter and I, my daughter is sitting here in the audience, she's 13. We happened to be in New York when you had Sandy the hurricane, and we could not leave New York for over a week. And I have some friends who uh, live in New York and told me that in New Jersey, uh, that told me that it took about three weeks to get electricity back. Well, in Mexico, we are really leaders in being able to reestablish 100% of the electricity quite rapidly. Actually, within two days of, Ma of Manuel and Ingrid in 2013, two hurricanes that hit us, one from the uh, Gulf and the other one from the Pacific, we were able to reestablish 98% uh, of the service, and by eight days we had full percent of the service for all the affected users. Um, something similar happened with the huge devastation that we had with Hurricane Odile in Baja California Sur in 2014, where it took a little bit longer, but by 17 days we had, were able to reestablish the transmission lines. And as you know, just a few days ago, we were uh, su uh, subjected to the what was considered the strongest, strongest hurricane ever uh, seen, uh, Hurricane Patricia. We were very fortunate because Hurricane Patricia decided not to enter through Puerto Vallarta, where we would have really affected the electricity sector, and neither through Manzanillo, where I would have been in deep trouble because it would have affected the supply of natural gas in Mexico. So it went right through the middle in the rural areas. Fortunately, we had a good uh, preparation for that, and people we, ha we had only six people who died, but for reasons, strange reasons, like, you know, people who were camping and a tree fell on, on them. But it's really a very small number if you think about the strength of that hurricane. And yet, within four days and over 2,000, uh, 61,000 people affected uh, from electricity shortages, within four days we were able to reestablish that. So this is an area where Mexico is moving forward well. In terms of addressing climate change, of course, um, the energy sector, as you know, is one of the key uh, pr uh, sectors affecting climate change. And we're working hard, not only the power sector, also in the oil and gas sector, moving into replacing and using more natural gas, 
natural gas, we see it as a transitioned fuel, but also doing cogeneration and venting, reducing the venting uh, and flaring of natural gas. Also, I'd like to comment that Mexico has a cl climate change legislation since 2000, 2012. We're the second country to have such a legislation after the UK. We have a carbon market platform in the Mexican stock exchange. Since 2014, we have a carbon tax on fossil fuels. And of course, uh, we have a post-2020 climate action plan that uh, uh, we are moving forward and we will are making commitments, even though we are not a so-called Annex One country, we are making voluntary commitments to really mitigate climate change. Also, as part of the reform and as part of the relationship that we have as a NAFTA country, we are increasing our interconnections with the United States. And one interesting thing is that we have some alliance, and increasingly we will be seeing these, where we export clean energies to the United States. So 100% clean energy. We have a really interesting project that SEMPRA developed in the border, uh, Baja California, in the border to export to uh, San Diego and basically supply wind energy in San Diego. Uh, we also have a very important program for de developing uh, the pipelines, interconnections with the United States and within Mexico to bring natural gas to all of the Mexican states. In addition to that, to bring natural gas to Central America. And of course, this is very important because it will help trigger uh, development and slow migration migration from uh, people in Central America and Southern Mexico looking for uh, opportunities when the opportunities can be created there. One important thing is, of course, we're taking advantage of the fact that uh, we are next to a country with the lowest rates in uh, terms of natural gas. And this means that this is helping us also uh, become more competitive and also uh, relaunch our petrochemical industry. And, uh, and of course, lower our emissions. This is very important to us. So let me point out something about what I think we women can do when we are in certain positions. I am convinced that, Mex uh, that women have a different way of viewing things than men. And one of the issues that we were able to put in the reform from the Constitution down to the legislation and now the implementation is a concept of sustainability. And we inscribe sustainability in Article 25 of our Constitution. When men were talking about sustainability, they were thinking about economic sustainability. And of course, our reform has that in the sense that we created something called the Mexican Petroleum Fund, which is a fund within the Central Bank of Mexico, which is an autonomous bank, uh, an autonomous body, which is, of course, um, you making sure that the oil rent is used in a right way and that it's used in a very transparent manner. But for us, it was also the environmental and the social part of it. So as part of the reform, we created a, a national agency for industrial safety and environmental protection of the hydrocarbon sector, which is sort of the Mexican BESI. And we have this division between the upstream regulator, CNH, and ASEA, which is in charge of industrial safety and environmental protection. In addition to that, I'm very proud to say that we included an important social component and human rights component. And this has to do with the fact that we included the social, social impact study, which is an obligation that the Ministry of Energy has to do as conduct a study prior to doing any bidding for uh, any energy project. And then any contractor or anybody in, in the private sector who wants to develop a project has to conduct a social impact uh, assessment and make sure that uh, there are uh, benefits that do come down to the community. In addition to that, if there is an indigenous community, we conduct the con consultation. Mexico is part of an international convention that asserts the right of uh, indigenous communities to uh, grant their agreement for projects that will have an impact, you know, like uh, environmental or other sorts of impact on the community. So we've been conducting these, these assessments, these consultations in places like Oaxaca for wind, windmill uh, projects, 
Uh, we've done that also for pipelines, like in Sonora with the Yaqui, Yaqui tribe. And um, it's been a really interesting pro uh, process, but I like to stress something. The people who are behind this, the team who's behind this, is a team of women. It, uh, it's really interesting. It started with one problem that was handed to me. My boss said to me when I was in the electricity sector, uh, you know, there is this huge project, 1,000, uh, I'm sorry, $1.2 billion that want to be invested in a windmill uh, project. And, you know, people are against it and we cannot do it and we cannot lose this investment. Go find out how we can make it work. And it turned out people were against the project because a lot of things were wrong with the way they were trying to implement it and the way the community was perceiving this. And it started like that and it ended up with a new office being created that um, answers directly to the secretary in terms of making sure that we have these social impact studies and these consultations and making sure that true benefits go to the communities. So this is very important because also within the law, we inscribe the fact that if, if, for instance, you win a contract for exploration and production, you need to have negotiations, and these negotiations have to be fair negotiations. The government grants support to uh, the community to make sure that they have the legal, financial, and whatnot uh, advice in terms of making sure that they get a good, good return. Also, a very important point that I like to stress, and this was really fundamental to Mexicans, is making sure that this whole reform was uh, implemented with full transparency and accountability. And the energy reform has this at different levels. Like, for instance, all the contracts that we are bidding right now, you can access internet, you don't have to pay for them, you can unload them, you can look at the terms and conditions, you can follow through internet the bidding day, uh, you can follow through the web page of the Mexican Petroleum Fund how much income we are receiving as part of this. But in addition to that, Mexico is part of the Open Government Partnership. Uh, we just had the summit a couple of weeks ago, and Mexico is preparing its um, candidacy that we will be presented, presenting in uh, February for the EITI, which is the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. Finally, let me mention the role of women. Um, one of the frustrations that I may have is that I think there are a lot of great women, very highly prepared, that could be in uh, occupying high-level positions. Unfortunately, there's always something wrong with the women. You know, maybe they are too outspoken, maybe there is something, you know. But the thing is, we have been able to move a little bit in the, in the direction of including women. One of the key players in defining the areas that we're bidding is the former commissioner to, of the National Hydrocarbons Commission, Dr. Alma America Porres, who is a, um, a geologist. Um, we have Montserrat Ramiro, who's now a commissioner at the Energy Regulatory Commission. And of course, the head of the National Institute for Nuclear Research is also a woman, Lydia Paredes. Let me take a minute to show you this graph. So in the Me Mexican Energy Ministry, you have 14% of the uh, high-level positions are held by women. But I'm very proud to say, and this is part of what I see as my job as a C3E ambassador, to make sure that we have more women. Uh, and so in my team, we have 42% are women and 58% are men. I know I'm still short of this 50-50, but I'm very proud to say that I have two deputies, one for the upstream and one for what we call industrial transformation, basically the mid and downstream. One is a man, the other one is a woman. My chief of staff is a woman. At least, I would say, 60% of the people in, my, in, in the chief of staff office are women. And what is really great is that we have a lot of younger women in, in, the 20, in their mid-20s, early 30s, really learning and working their way up. We also have a group uh, of women in energy uh, these are not women necessarily in government. These are women in the private sector, in academia, women who are interested in participating and helping each other and giving each other support. We started as a group of friends meeting together for a glass of wine or maybe breakfast. We used to be four or five. Nowadays, there are over 30 or 40 women 
who meet at least once a month to talk about energy issues and some other issues as well. Because as, as you, you could see today, there were women here with their babies. I was very happy to see recipients who are almost eight or nine months pregnant. Uh, and of course, I have my daughter here because of course, we are women, we have to work, we do a good job, but we also are mothers and, and that's part of, of who we are. And so um, it's, uh, it's what end up, ends up happening. We talk a little bit about, about everything. So C3 initiative, I think it's a, C3 initiative is really a powerful initiative. It's really important to be able to have uh, something like this, to have a dialogue with women, to have the opportunity of watching very bright women uh, move on in, in these fields. And I just would like to say I'm really, really grateful to have had the opportunity to address, to address you today. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for uh, giving me a wonderful, wonderful day. It's, I've really enjoyed it. And thank you for everything. And if you're interested, you can uh, go to our web page, a lot of information about what's going on in Mexico. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Melgar. What an incredible story. And I think this underscores the impact that an individual can make. So if you think you can't do a lot to solve the problems that we have, uh, just look at the, the story that uh, Dr. Melgar has just told. Okay, so um, some closing remarks here. Um, MIT is delighted to be working closely with the Department of Energy to help grow this valuable professional network of women working on tough ch challenges of climate mitigation and resilience. The connections that are made here between the attendees are long lasting and valuable. This symposium is incredibly special because the focus on women at all stages of careers and from many vantage points, researchers, entrepreneurs, lawyers, corporate leaders, and government representatives. It's a great mix and it's gratifying to see that our reach is going beyond the United States with Deputy Secretary Melgar's participation today. Of course, as an educational institution, we see the benefits of this symposium for students in the nascent stages of their careers. Feedback from students, both graduate and undergraduate level, is that they leave more excited than ever about their future role. Last week, MIT launched its ambitious plan for climate action, whose core theme is that we need to all work together to combat the threat of climate change. We need to view climate as a global problem that engages all sectors, academia, government, industry, and beyond. We also need to view climate as a, as a local problem in which each of us works within our communities to achieve solutions. The magnitude of the challenge is an attractor of talent and must galvanize us towards action with the knowledge that a zero carbon future is achievable. Finally, it is my pleasure to announce that because these awards are so important and that we want to increase their visibility, DOE and MITEI are opening them up to mid-career women as of right now. We look forward to receiving your nominations and increasing the cohort of C3E awardee alumni in 2016. Thank you all for attending. <laughs>